Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the Leadership Lounge. We are powered by TDL and we're creating a community of future focused leaders. And the aim of the podcast is to add value to your leadership journey. And we're going to be speaking to amazing people with amazing stories and experts in their field. So if you haven't already, make sure you hit the um, subscribe button on your um, podcast provider if you're listening to us on the move. Um, or if you're watching us on the YouTube channel, make sure you hit subscribe. And every Wednesday at 6 a.m., uh, another episode will be coming your way. So today we are speaking to Morris. How are you, sir? Hey, Stuart. I'm very well, thank you. Thanks for the invitation. Well, <laughs> that's it's my pleasure. I, I only this morning reminded myself that um, John Stevenson, one of our previous episode guests, um, put me in contact with you. So, And I always love a good recommendation. Uh, so I, I can't wait to hear your story, and I'm sure the listeners will get a lot from um, resonating with some of the things they can then link to and they can um, reference on your journey. So as I hit the 20-minute timer, um, for the people who don't know who you are, could you let us know who you are, where you are, and um, what you do now? Hi, yep, um, my name is Morris Hepworth. Um, I'm married to Megan. I've got six children, three boys, three girls and nine grandkids. I live near Durham and um, I have my own business, MH Coaching and Leadership. My leadership journey started at Sunderland Football Club where I was a professional footballer. Bad injury forced me away from the game to South Africa where I played for Arcadia Shepherds, uh, a team in Pretoria. And we were the first club ever to play a black player in apartheid South Africa. So that is a that is a story on its own. Uh, yeah. Got another bad injury in South Africa, um, double combined broken leg. So I came back to England with one of my mentors' introduction to PepsiCo in London. And that was the start of my retail journey. And um, over the years, I've had three or four mentors. And I went from PepsiCo to uh, KFC, KFC to Pizza Hut, Pizza Hut to Heineken, and I spent 20 years in Heineken working in various parts of their business, uh, retail, uh, HR, training, um, and uh, yeah, it's been quite a journey. And I set up Image Coaching and Leadership uh, 13 years ago now, so I decided to go on my own and um, and enjoy, enjoy, you know, just just what I could provide on my own. Yeah, fantastic. And and I, I sort of alluded to this at the start, didn't I, saying that me looking at your story, even you, I didn't realise how many different changes you had within retail as well and, and the different industries you've been in, the companies and the brands. But change has been a big part of your journey, hasn't it? So in your perspective, how much does change link to leadership and how does it mould that journey along the way? I think leadership, I mean, change has been a part of my life, as, you, as you're aware of. Um, my football career at Sunderland, I signed as an apprentice at uh, 16, made my debut at 17, was in the first team squad for the FA Cup final, 73, captain of the reserves, Wednesday prior, uh, ruptured spleen, burst duodenum, and ruptured bowel that, that night in that game. Uh, not only did it nearly lose my life but it was also a massive change because I never played again for Sunderland in the first team because um, Bob Stoker didn't feel I'd recovered enough from my injury so then the next change was very much along the lines of well you know go to South Africa and um, he introduced just me to a guy called Saul Sachs who was chairman of the football club but he was also managing director of a soft drink company and one of the franchises we had was PepsiCo. So I started part-time initially in South Africa, where I became a sales rep for the chairman and played football uh, part-time during the week. And I learned very quickly how to, how to sell, how to use my personality and who I was to, um, to build sales and develop opportunities within the business. And then um, following that uh, unbelievable night when we had Vincent Julius on our team as we ran out in front of sort of uh, 35,000 people, um, it was, it was life-changing in terms of 
where I went to from a career perspective, both retail and football. So I, I got promoted as to an, uh, to regional manager, then uh, regional director at, at um, Shillings Minerals, were called. And then I went pro. I went professional because it was just, you know, the football, uh, we had 10 teams come in to, from a white perspective, white teams. We had 10 black teams and we formed a national professional league. So when I had my br leg break, a double compound fracture leg break in South Africa, again, uh, it was a horrendous injury and that did finish me. So my mentor and boss, Saul Sachs, gave me an amazing letter of introduction to a guy, my second mentor, John Crandall at PepsiCo in London. And I took this letter to John Crandall and um, within 35, 40 minutes, he said, okay, when can he join the team? So I joined PepsiCo International, which was Europe as well. And he really gave me the opportunity and yeah, I introduced me to some wonderful people. Um, and I was there for 18 months as, uh, key, as cash and carry manager. Then I went to national account director, which was the big boys. You're talking Sainsbury's, Tesco, negotiating with those guys in, in London. And um, also, one thing else is that, you know, you take Pepsi and Coca-Cola and, and also the, the all own label branded industry was really starting to lift its, lift its profitable head. So when I was going into Tesco and Sainsbury's, people like that, the buyers, you know, the buying directors, I wasn't just talking about PepsiCo being a, you know, to me, it was never a second brand, but, but uh, politically and advertising wise, I mean, Coke is the number one brand. So you had to be on your toes to be able to get some distribution increases from a second brand to, them, to the brand leader, but also from the price led discount brand. So it was a real baptism of fire. Um, and I did that for two and a half years and I, I really enjoyed it. So um, can I pick up on that? So some of the things in our leadership journey and, and people talk about influence quite a lot yeah, <laughs> and, and influencing other people. And so what sort of things have you learned along the way about the good, like how to influence people? Because that's a big part of leadership, isn't it? So you're obviously talking about a, a transition of sales, but it, that also comes up, doesn't it? It's people management leadership however you want to put it there is an element of influence what what are your sort of key takeaways of what you've learned over the time about how to influence people in a positive way <laughs> yeah i think yeah i think you know part of it is is Stuart, is understanding actually who you are and and this is something i work a lot on in my business but it's also having it's, it's about confidence it's about knowledge knowledge of yourself knowledge of your product confidence in your product confidence in yourself and being able to be, um, I've got four words that I live my life by Stuart. Um, one is, you know, number one is, is um, uh, authenticity. You know, you've got to be authentic. Uh, transparency. Um, and you've got to be transparent and you also have to be able to storytell. And as I've gone through my life, as you can hear already, you know, there are some stories that I can share that are, that are real and, you know, link that to listening as well. The number one for me, Stuart, is listening. So listening, storytelling, transparency, authenticity, and then knowing who you are and knowing your products. And it's about, you know, how you, how you relate to that particular person. So let's say I'm sitting in front of the buying director of, of Sainsbury's and we're having a chat about a brand leader. We're having a chat about sales from a, um, a discount product. Why would you want it? Why, why would I buy PepsiCo? So you have to be able to a, know what you're talking about, a, know your product, but also know and being able to talk to someone in a man, in a way where they will actually get who you are and what you represent both, not just in a, terms of your company but also the person that's sitting in front of them and that has always been a high priority in everything I do Stuart mm. 
And you know, the cliche of people buy from people. I mean, it, it's true. It's true. Yeah, uh, I know. Uh, there's several of them out there, aren't there? Where they they are cliche, but they are so true. You're so right. Yeah. Um, you mentioned quite a lot in your journey that you have mentors, and the reason I picked up on that is because I've had some great people around me. Um, and another cliche is the. The, the people around you are the your success aren't they the people that Absolutely. you and I like the one where it, the rooms that you're in as well there, there's several there as well <laughs> but what are some of the learnings that you've had from the people that you've surrounded yourself with whether you um yeah what what have you taken on board because that's such an important thing as like uh, they say le- leadership can be lonely at the top um it doesn't have to be at the top uh, I amalgamated two sayings then <laughs> but it can be lonely at times and and sometimes some of the best advice is to go and speak to people and and they will listen um so what what, what have you picked up from your mentors i think from from Saul Sachs in south africa um who was our chairman and and uh, md of the company i worked for and owner um he had he 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 kind of put his arm around my shoulder from a very early time and I trusted him and I felt I felt valued by him and I listened to what his wisdom I listened to his wisdom he was a man of great wisdom and I was quite young then and I kind of left home at 16 at Sunderland so my father and I, I never went back you know I was always around the world and I kind of needed that base of someone who had knowledge and wisdom, not just about business, but about life and about being able to to kind of be a father figure for me at that time. Mm-hmm. So that's where Saul was, and and you know he he trusted me with a with with his business. He trusted me with his his family, and and he introduced me to a lot of people, and um, and that was brave of him. And and I always wanted to repay him and. And we had a really good work and in personal relationship because he knew what he knew what he got from me, which was total commitment. So that was one, you know, the second one, a guy called John Crandall, who was a uh, managing director of Pepsi Corp UK. And John was an American guy. And I have such a lot of time for the American personality and the way that they are able to tell stories just John was just incredible, but John told stories about how to influence and how to actually raise people up and make them feel um, secure in 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 your presence. And um, he was just he taught me about personality. He, he was so charismatic. I mean, and he told me about you know art. I didn't, you know, sometimes you don't realize that actually you are quite a charismatic character because it's something that people don't really talk about. And that's something else like you that I work with, you know, when people are with me. But, you know, and just being natural. So John John was such a charismatic, I'd have, I'd have, like with Saul, you know, I'd have, I'd have, I'd have, you know, I'd have gone over the top with John and Saul, no problem at all, you know, no problem. Yeah. So those are, you know, my first two um I had a guy called um, uh, Damien Damien Atkinson, who uh, was a HR director at Heineken, and he gave me he gave me my first senior role from uh, within Heineken, and we went through all the de- all you know all the tests and everything like that. But one of the biggest things he said to me he said, "You know, tests. You know the the." all the testing and everything goes with it is important he says but you know one of the biggest things you can't you cannot train personality you cannot train um the ability to communicate you can't train it but it's got to be a natural gift and it is a gift which um which uh, which which he taught me to understand mm. and to use to, to be able to use so add that to all the other three, the other couple of gifts that my other two mentors. Um, and again, you know, he was someone that I felt I could go back to, someone I'm still in contact with now. And, um, you know, so that, that was kind of my Heineken um, mentor. You know, I went to him 
I love um, that because it's something's in trouble. It's saying about storytelling. I've got a funny attachment to storytelling because it was the only time I left the military where I saw the the label of storytelling. I was asked one of my associate roles to deliver a whole day workshop on storytelling. And I yeah. was like, what, what's this? In a kind of what am I going to do? And why, 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 why? <laughs> And it goes into like the um, the chemicals in the brain that are released and how we yeah. as a society through um, how we're influenced by movies and adverts. And it, it opens up such a spectrum because when you were talking then, I was thinking some people might be listening to this saying, oh, I haven't got any stories. Oh. What would you say to that person? I know what I would say, like just, yeah, go, you go first. What would you say to somebody that oh, I haven't got any stories? For me, I mean, story. I mean, I, you know, I've probably told about seven or eight stories already on this podcast. And it's story, storytelling is about your life. Storytelling mm -hmm. is about the realities. We all have stories to tell. We are all unique and we all have stories to tell. And um, like I said, you know, in South Africa, um, one of the biggest stories, that, you know, so for me, I mean, I could tell stories till the cows come home. I love telling stories because... <laughs> Um, it, it just brings people alive. So if I'm, you know, like now, you know, the one's a quick story. Let's say um, I'm sitting in the dressing room in front of the 35,000 people and our first black player, Vincent Julius, is sitting opposite me and we don't know why he's there. So the chairman comes in, Sol Sachs, and says to us, OK, guys, um, you've got two choices now. You can either stay, get changed and go out and create history or you can get up and leave because there's a there's a real threat you'll be you will be arrested after this game and he told us and then the gaffer told us the team and i mean how long have you got for a story like that so you look back at who you are again it goes back to who you are and you listen listen to who you are listen to what's happened to you and then tell a story about it and everybody yeah. has stories to tell Stuart. I, and, and it's so powerful. It's something that I, I still talk. I tell stories about parenting. I tell stories yeah. about sports. I tell stories yeah. about military, and it just mm -hmm. opens up the room, doesn't it? It gets people thinking differently. And um, we we've got four minutes left. I want you to tell. Can you tell a story a little bit about? I was interested about your football background and your football l linking to your leadership. Obviously, your football played a really big part of your early years um the career of 10 years and then you go into, into corporate is, is there anything that you've taken if i was to say where your foundations of why you were so successful post football what were those foundations built in the dressing room on the football field what what leadership showed up there what did you learn great question um when i made my debut um guy called Martin Harvey, who played for Northern Ireland, he, he talked me through that match. And previous to that, I'd already been sort of youth team captain, captain of the reserves. And I think, you know, to the dressing room, you have to have the respect in the dressing room and you have to be, you don't, I was never one of the boys in the dressing room. Uh, yeah, I, I, was, I was always part of the dressing room. But there comes a time, you know, when, when you have to think and listen. And um, I just, you know, I, I led by example. And, you know, if there was a 60-40 ball there, I'd be in there winning it or trying to win it. And I carried that on, you know, uh, as a, from the youth team to the reserves. Um, I mean, I was captain of the reserves at 18. And I had people, you know, who've been playing internationals playing in the reserves when I was captain of the reserves. And that was a difficult, that was a real um, way of learning how to manage people and how to talk to people. Um, so I think addressing, but once, you know, if you look at management and leadership, uh, I use this when I go into senior leadership positions and, and coach, you know, once you've lost a dressing room, it's very, very difficult to pick that dressing room up again. And I, I you know, I know very quickly when someone's lost a dressing room and to lose a dressing room, like I can look at Premier League now, I can look at various things and be able to think, yeah, you know, you've lost a dressing room there or what's the reason why they've lost it or 
Like, you know, so there are so many things that I can take away from football. Like when I go into a, into a school, I know straight away it has a head teacher lost the dressing room because it's the same principle. Yeah. It's like, it's like a father, you know, you know yourself. We used to have team meetings in my family because we were in, I was in, I was under pressure of losing the dressing room. And the dressing room, <laughs> you know. I'm laughing because so, I can relate. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know that. So football was a, a massive part. I, I learned so much. I, I had lots of heartache, lots and lots of heartache. And you have to be resilient. One of the things in, you know, leadership, one of the things of being a parent yeah, you know, in your life, you got to be resilient because, boy, you will get some some real tough calls thrown at you. And as a parent or in my life of, you know, which I have a huge faith, um, you know, I lost I lost my son-in-law to suicide. Um, I have stage four prostate cancer. My wife has had a mastectomy. And I've turned that around to work with people to help them go through these parts of their life. So you look at reality versus theory and everything is transferable. Mm. And you just, but it's about loving people. And it's about looking them in the eye and letting them know that actually, you know what? You can trust me here. So you go back to listening, storytelling, transparency, and authenticity, Stuart. And, you know, you bring that to your life. And, you know, you're in with a real shout. You really are. Well, do you know what? What a great way of finishing the podcast. I think, if anything, the takeaway from that was, and I'd love to hear people's takeaways and how you can relate to that as well, because I can certainly relate to that. And I think that really sums up the power of storytelling so thank you so much um ladies and gents make sure you um hit subscribe make sure you hit follow make sure you tell us the elements that you can um resonate with in that story um thank you so much for joining me again morris um we will stay connected and um if you want to check out um Morris's links make sure you hit the um, show notes below and um, thank you again Stuart, uh, honestly, any time at all, and um, it's it's wonderful to talk to you. And congratulations on what you're doing. You know, it it makes a difference and changes lives. So well done. Thank you so much. And do you know what? Just on that note as well, the new version of the podcast, um, we are hosting panel discussions. So it allows us to bring guests back. So I'm sure you're going to get an invite to a panel discussion. Um, probably something to do with high performance in sport linked to corporate. But we'll get you back. <laughs> Thank you so much Thank again. You. And ladies and gents, we'll see you all next week. Take care. Bye.